right, so we're going to get started. Welcome, uh, one and all. So happy to have so many people here with us today uh, to celebrate Nancy Holt, Massachusetts. My name's Rebecca Uchel. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this full day of activities and conversations sparked by our campus sculpture, Spinwinder, right in front of me and behind most of you. This morning, we will hear from a number of different <clears throat> perspectives on this sculpture, from its entrenchments in financial and labor systems, to its material history, to its relationship to and inspiration for other works of public sculpture on our campus. The work was created in 1991 as part of the Massachusetts Art and Public Places program. Uh, it was affiliated with the construction of the Dion Science Building right behind me here. Nancy Holt worked with Bob Jennings, uh, an engineer locally, to create this work, making use, as she so often did, of standard industrial materials and similarly making reference to local industries, namely the regional textile industry, which we will hear about very soon in Ranger Andy Schnetzer's tour. Nancy Holt had a very personal relationship to this region and to those industries. This sculpture has formal relationships with tools and machines that would have been used at the New Bedford Textile School where her grandfather uh, worked. She embedded artifacts from those regional histories in the local textile industry within the foundation of the sculpture in the center. And she decided to make this work uh, interactive in the sense that people could move the spools and the center element uh, around the central uh, element of dirt where there would be no growth. Now, re up until recently, those final features were a little bit harder uh, to, to see, actually. Uh, in fact, the spools weren't moving so much until quite recently, but thanks to some of the restoration efforts that we've been doing, we're able uh, now to interact with the sculpture, and I encourage everybody to do so uh, in a moment when we uh, have a little bit more of an open-ended moment to view the sculpture. At the same time, though, there are some things that haven't been restored. If you look, you'll see, for example, there's moss growing on one of the spools of the sculpture. When thinking about these kinds of changes, we might think of Holt's 1993 interview with Joyce Pomeroy Schwartz, done just a couple of years after Spinwinder was complete. Holt said, I always had a desire to build works that were going to be in their places for a long time because I wanted to see how nature changes the works. They go through these cycles because of time and natural cycles. Pomeroy Schwartz asks, so you don't mind if the works change or if plant material grows up on them? Holt responds, no, I like that. And I like going back and seeing the work at different times of year. I like seeing them in the snow and the rain and the mist. We have this idea that the pictures we see of sculptures are always on nice sunny days like this one with an ideal condition. But she goes on to say that some of her works are meant to interact, for example, with conditions of rain. I do hope people will continue to come back to see this work in all of its cycles of time. This is a place-based work. We're very pleased that we have the honor of stewarding it on our campus. And uh, we're especially pleased that we're able on its 30th anniversary of this year and effectively right now, to also realize finally 30 years later, a plaque that was always intended by Nancy Holt to talk about some of these histories that I just mentioned. The order of events for this morning is as follows. We're going to have a series of short talks by park uh, rangers and facilities directors and artists speaking about works of public sculpture in this vicinity. We'll have a quick moment for Q&A, but we'll also have kind of a discursive ability to keep talking with each other over the course of the day. We shouldn't feel like this is sort of a unidirectional uh, lecture type of situation. It has to be that way a little bit because of the megaphone and in order to make sure that we can all hear each other. But people should feel free to explore the sculpture, interact with the sculpture, talk with each other as we move between places today. So I'd like to introduce uh, Ranger Andy Schnetzer, but I've, I seem to have misplaced his, his introduction. Do you have that with you? No. A ranger who needs no introduction. <laughs> That's true. But I'm going to introduce him anyway because we <laughs> love Ranger Andy Schnetzer. And you will too. Andy Schnetzer 
has worked for the National Park Service since April 2007. After spending most of his career in public service as a wildland firefighter, he discovered his love of teaching American history while at the Natchez Trace Parkway. After shifting careers within the agency to interpretation and education, he has found new and innovative ways of connecting arts and culture organizations to national parks. His approach is centered around tempering the traditions of the agency, such as the uniform, the ranger talk as pedagogy, and the agency's habit of creating mythologies of America's heritage. He believes that partners of the parks, such as arts and culture institutions, should be empowered to find their own stories, such as, to find their own stories and to see themselves reflected in the preservation and retelling of America's past. He's now a ranger at Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park, where he focuses on the industrial heritage of New England, from the floating factories of whale ships to the Leviathan-sized brick textile mills. The 19th and 20th century's legacy offers us glimpses into our own future, says Ranger Andy, a future optimistically shaped by social, environmental, and restorative justice. Ranger Andy's talk today happens on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of the New Bedford Whaling National Historical Park, and his tour, Whales to Weaves, Industry Remembered, is part of that celebration. A big round of applause for Ranger Andy as he takes the virtual stage. So, uh, thank you for having me here today. I am really delighted to be here. And my name is Andy Schnetzer. I'm a park ranger at Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park. My office is in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. So, I know what you're thinking. Why is he here? So for about six years, I was a park ranger at New Bedford Whaling National Historical Park. And during those six years, Dr. Uchel and I worked on several projects together. Uh, this, sadly for me, being the last of them maybe for, for a while. Uh, and I have to say, the partnership that Dr. Uchel and I were able to establish based on communication and trust and and bravery and trying new things and innovating new ideas was, was so informative to me and helped shape me as a ranger. And, and I've taken that to other national parks now, right? And so on the 25th anniversary of the establishment of New Bedford Whaling National Historical Park, not only am I really delighted to be here, but I'd really like to, to point out that the National Park Service is a better organization because of Dr. Uchel. <laughs> it's true, nice it's that. really true. Closer, okay, closer. <clears throat> and so when we think about the south coast of Massachusetts, we think about New Bedford, Bristol County, Dartmouth, usually whaling is the first thing to come to mind. And I recently learned that when they were talking about establishing a new national park in New Bedford, one of the early ideas was a textile story. And at the time, there had already been, kind of recently, created a national park in Massachusetts that tells the textile story, right? Lowell National Historical Park. And so they went through and they decided really to focus on the whaling history. And you know, I think that that was, in part, a really good call. Uh, whaling began industry. Whaling, sometimes we think of, is, is the first industry. It was really the vanguard of modern American capitalism. Whale ships are often referred to as floating factories. And if we think about what modern capitalism kind of looks like today and, and how that slowly evolved, the whaling merchants of New Bedford were a few people who owned the entire means of production. And they went on these, they, they, they sponsored, they funded these floating factories that went all around the world. And they extracted resources from around the world and brought those resources back. And they used very cheap labor and they they really did everything that they could to maximize their profits. So much so that by 1852, about the peak year of the whaling industry, 
New Bedford was one of the wealthiest cities in America. And 1852 really began to establish the United States as the leader in energy production around the world. About 10 years later, we're in the middle of the Civil War. A few years, they discover oil, petroleum in the ground. The whaling industry began to decline. And the whaling merchants of New Bedford were looking for a long time of other ways they could invest all of this massive amount of money that they had produced for generations now. They invested in railroads, uh, and all kinds of other projects across the country, and they began to invest in textiles. And Wamsutta Mill was built in New Bedford. Interestingly enough, the original plan was for Wamsutta to be built in the South, in Georgia or South Carolina. Pressure kind of brought that back here, and it was ultimately built on the banks of the Akushnet River in New Bedford. At its peak, Wamsutta Mill had the most powerful coreless steam engine ever built. It employed thousands of people, and by the early 1900s, New Bedford had produced hundreds of thousands of spindles and tens of thousands of looms and was producing some of the world's finest cotton textiles. Whaling was done, textile manufacturing had arrived. And now here we are today, and we're looking at monuments and sculptures and memorials. And I'd like to look at this one, and I'd like to think of it in terms of a memorial, of a monument. And how does New Bedford recognize the whaling industry and its monuments? In fact, if we think about monuments in general, how does the country create monuments? What sort of experience are we supposed to have when we approach a monument or a memorial, right? It's, it towers above us, we stand below it, and we're supposed to decide somehow for ourselves how much awe we're supposed to be feeling about what this monument represents. But this is something entirely different. This invites us into it. It begs us to reflect on our own position, our, our stance, within this story, within this history. And I believe that, that when you're standing here, you actually become a part of the story, which is something that, that the whaling story very rarely gives you an opportunity to do. But this modern textile story and, and this sculpture here on a campus that has so many beautiful and remarkable sculptures, this one really stands out as as something noteworthy and something that I want to be a part of. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Ranger Angie, everybody. Now, we, we all love Ranger Andy, like most of us did just moments before. So it's such a rare opportunity to have the occasion to learn about one sculpture and interpret it through so many different perspectives. And it is a real honor for me to now uh, turn so things cool. over to Bill Traubel. He was the director of facilities and physical plant for the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth between 1987 and 1993. During this time, he was involved in evaluating Holt's proposals for and supporting the production of Spinwinder, this 1991 sculpture that was produced as part of the Massachusetts 1% for Art program. Following his time at UMass Dartmouth, Traubel joined Princeton University as their director of grounds and building maintenance. He's a former army engineer and assistant professor of mathematics at West Point and has a storied resume, which unfortunately I cannot tell you all about now, but we'll hear a little bit about in just a moment. The title of the talk that Bill Traubel submitted to us was Buildings and Grounds, Construction and Maintenance versus Art. Both can and always should be winners. <laughs> but I understand that there may be a modification to this title in store for us today. I hope we're all still winners at the end of it. But before I turn it over to Bill, I would like to invite Eaton McKenna Bateman, uh, the Ledoux Center uh, Arts Ambassador, assistant to our symposium. Uh, 
I'd like to invite her up here to say a few words in introduction to Bill. Because today is Veterans Day, we want to acknowledge the service of Bill Traubel. Traubel was commissioned in, the 1966, in 1966 as an engineer lieutenant in the Corps of Engineers and served in several active duty troop units in Germany, Vietnam, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, and Fort Drum, New York. He also taught math at the U.S. Military Academy, West Point, and managed civilian and military facilities groups at Fort Detrick, Maryland, and West Point, New York. Thank you for your service, Lieutenant Colonel Traubel, and welcome back to UMass Dartmouth. Well, very lovely introduction. Thank you. And I purposely wore my American Legion shirt because veterans can join the Veterans of Foreign Wars or the American Legion. And it's a wonderful social group working together, uh, promoting you know, the young children to, to go to the service academies and to join the service and so forth. Anyhow, proud to wear my shirt, but not proud to be in short sleeves. Uh, it was a good idea initially. Okay, way closer. Yay! Oh, too close. <laughs> I can hear the back feed. Too close. Yeah, okay, very good. Okay, anyhow, um, it is a pleasure being back here. Uh, I was the facilities director from, as they said, 87 to 93. And in those six years, a lot happened, not the least of which there were four presidents during those six years. And um, several name changes over time. We acquired the Sw uh, Swain School of Design. They merged with UMass Dartmouth, SMU. But the funniest one I remember about that time was how cool it was to say we're from SMU. Some of you may know of a football team called Southern Methodist University, and they happened to have a one-year suspension for playing football. So we could go around saying, we're the SMU with a football team. Uh, it, it was a great time, and I enjoyed very much working here. Three of my four children are alumni of UMass Dartmouth, and uh, I think it's funny how we use those names and confuse people uh, with Dartmouth University and Amherst. It's amazing, but I love being back here, and uh, my family still lives in the area. Will's Building is a sculpture graduate from here. My son Will runs a business here, and I'm very proud of his activities. But now, as to this particular piece of sculpture, I bring to you something that most people do not know and do not know how they would learn it other than hearing somebody talk about it. So listen up. Uh, Nancy Holt is an amazing uh, artist, an amazing sculptor, and she was given the commission to design something for this particular campus. At the time, in 1987, the sites considered were Cedar Del Pond, put something down there, put something by this pond, put it on the banks of the amphitheater, uh, this ultimately was chosen as the site, and as Re uh, Rebecca said, it was tied to the funding for this building, the Dion Science Building, which was built at that time, right, right around 1991. So all those six years took to uh, figure this thing out. Uh, Nancy had several ideas. This was not her original idea. Her, this is what she ended up with, and it's amazing how it's held up. And the story I'm going to tell you is why it held up. Uh, Nancy originally wanted to Bill, build... Can you shout that story into the microphone, into the megaphone? Shout it. Shout it. Yeah. Uh, okay. We all want to hear it. Okay, I'm yeah. shouting. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, her first in, uh, envisioned sculpture was going to have a vertical element. That's all I know about it. This is only by hearsay. And the architect of this wonderful campus is Paul Rudolph. And Paul Rudolph objected to that particular design because it would have competed with the Campanile. And so uh, that's why that never happened. Now, then I, she had an idea that she really liked, and she talked to me about it, and I really didn't like it. And uh, I told her why. And one of the nicest things about artists is they do listen. They like feedback. I found that they, when they do their sculptures and, and their art, they have peer reviews. They, they worry more about the peer review than their grade, and that's really good. Artists are very conscientious. So Nancy wanted to know why I objected. And so over lunch at the Sunset Room, Willie, my son, was with us, and the three of us had such an enjoyable, amicable conversation. It's, I want your piece of art to stand the test of time. 
I don't want it to be beautiful on day one and be trashed on day two. I want to be able to maintain it, but my budget has been slashed. Positions in my department have been lost and not replaced. We've added square footage with a Swain School. We added square footage with the DOM building, and I still have fewer people than I started with, a lot fewer. So I can't divert maintenance money and time to preserve what she was going to design. It was a, a water structure. I'll just leave it at that. You talk about a fountain. You talk about a pond of water. No matter what you're trying to symbolize, it does not maintain itself. And you often will see in cities, places where they had a wonderful fountain, and you'll see it filled with trash. And I didn't want that to happen here. It's going to reflect on me. It's going to reflect on you. So let's build something that will stand the test of time and not take my maintenance budget and not be neglected. There it is. So that's really it, folks. This, this piece reflecting the history of textiles and the fishing, whaling industry is very well represented in the spinning and the winding of the components of that piece of sculpture. So we owe a, a very large vote of support and thanks to the integrity of Nancy Holt in uh, backing off what she was going to do and listening to developing something that is requiring virtually no maintenance. And the fact that it's looking like that 30 years later is a testament to what she did. I'm very proud to be a part of it. Very happy to be back here with you and thanks for your attention. Spill Tribal, I can't believe it. Amazing that we have you here. Thank you.